Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave, and today we're talking about JavaScript object composition versus inheritance, and why composition not only keeps your code dry, but also flexible. Let's get started. Okay, today we're talking about JavaScript object composition versus JavaScript object inheritance. And of course, for inheritance to happen, we have to have classes that we extend. So let's look at an example of a JavaScript class. You can see I've got a pizza class here. It has a constructor that accepts a size, crust, and sauce. It also starts with an empty toppings array in the constructor. And then it has three methods. We've just got prepare, bake, and ready. And these all log to the console, preparing, baking, and ready, just to have something in these methods. Now let's look at an example of another class, and we already have a problem. And the problem is these repeating methods in each class. It's not dry, which stands for don't repeat yourself. This class is a salad, so another food item on the menu and the constructor accepts a size and dressing, and that's fine. But look at the methods. Two of the methods repeat. We've got prepare and ready, just like a pizza. Now, pizza bakes, and we toss a salad. But other than that, these are identical methods that we've had to recreate in the salad. Now, one way we could solve this is to have a parent class, possibly just called food, and we would give the methods prepare and ready to that food class, and then the pizza and the salad could both inherit those methods. And that would be one way around this problem. However, when we start out our applications with classes, we kind of have to predict the future. Say the pizza place just made pizza for the first few years and didn't need this salad class, and then we have to come back into their software and create it. And we couldn't really predict that before. Of course, we could have possibly started with a generic food item if we had thought something like that would occur, but you just never know. And now let's look at some more examples. Say we get another class, stuffed crust pizza, that extends the regular pizza. And now this is inheritance. So we're inheriting from the pizza class using the extends keyword. And the only thing we're adding is a stuff method. And let's say that's a special that the manager wants to add for a month. It's something new on the menu. And then the next month, the manager wants to add a buttered crust pizza. So that's the special. And the buttered crust pizza has a butter method. And so now we've got a stuffed crust pizza that is inherited from pizza. And we've got a buttered crust pizza that inherits from pizza. But now the third month, the manager decides what if we have a stuffed buttered crust pizza. Now we've already extended pizza for the stuffed crust pizza, and we've extended pizza for the buttered crust pizza, but now we need to have both things. We need to have the stuff method and the butter method all in one for the stuffed buttered crust pizza. And the problem again is it repeats the methods. Now we could possibly put butter in the normal pizza and then just not use that method unless it's a buttered crust pizza. But once again, we need to predict the future and that is hard to do. And then you're also kind of clogging up the other classes, the parent class above, if it doesn't really need the butter method or shouldn't have the butter method until it's a buttered crust pizza. So the problem we run into is we're not able to predict the future. And the next thing you know, we're repeating the methods in the code, and that makes our code not dry, which stands for don't repeat yourself. Let's go ahead and create a pizza with the stuffed buttered crust pizza class that is inherited from pizza. And then we can go ahead and call the stuff method and the butter method. I'll save the file, and we can look at the console, and we get stuffing the crust and buttering the crust as we would expect these to work. So really, everything works as we want it to and expect it to, it's just that our code isn't dry. And so the solution to the problem that we're running into with inheritance is to use composition. And we can use composition for each of the methods. So 
instead of putting them in a class, let's just make a function for each method that we want, like prepare and bake and toss. And you can see in the prepare function, and I've made it an arrow function, it returns a prepare method, just like we had before. And that is perfect. So we can use all of these functions. We've also got a ready function and a stuff function and a butter function. So everything we had before. And now we can compose a function that really composes an object. So we pass in size, crust, and sauce. And here we define a pizza object. But then we don't return the pizza object right away we return an object down here and we use the spread operator and pass in pizza. And then we can pass in any of the methods that we need. And so for the create pizza, these would be the generic methods that we expect a pizza to have, which are prepare, bake, and ready. And then underneath that, if we create a salad, we can return a salad with size and dressing. And then we can also pass in prepare, toss and ready. And notice we didn't have to recreate the prepare or ready method. So our code is still dry. Now, if we compare to an ES6 class and that syntax uses extends and possibly even the super in the constructor, which would pull in the properties of the previous object or the parent object, and I do have an example of that if you watch the Proto video or what is Proto. And I also have a video on classes. I'll put both of those down in the description for you. And I should be able to at least link one above right now. But if we compare, now we've got a create stuffed buttered crust pizza. So we can just pass in a pizza object. Let's create a pizza object first with our create pizza function. And then we'll pass that in and use the spread syntax to spread that out. And then we'll go ahead and give it stuff and butter methods. And it will already have the methods that a pizza has, which are prepare, bake, and ready. And once again, we've been able to extend our previous object and we have not had any issue creating the stuff method twice. If we had a simple stuff crust pizza, we would just use the same method and use composition to create these objects. And that is where it really benefits. So let's create a pizza called another pizza. And we pass in the size and the crust and the sauce, I believe, was the other, yes, sauce. So we got size, crust, and sauce as we create this pizza. And it's just called another pizza. And from there, we can call somebody's pizza and we can use create stuffed buttered crust pizza and pass in this another pizza to create that. So let's go ahead and save that much. And I guess nothing comes to the console yet. Let's see what I've got here. Oh, I wanted to show one other way. Without creating this another pizza, you could just set one uh, variable like Dave's pizza here equal to create stuffed buttered crust pizza but here, since create pizza returns a new pizza object, you could just pass it in as the parameter to the create stuffed buttered crust pizza. So this is kind of a nested function call, and it's really working towards functional composition when you do that. But this would be one way to do the same thing we did on two lines above, but we're just creating the pizza right inside the parameter you would expect for the create stuffed buttered crust pizza. Okay, after that, now let's, oh, we're gonna create a salad as well. We have our salad uh, composition function up here for an object. And after that, we're, we're going to go ahead and log some stuff to the console. So I'll save this, and my Dave's Pizza created right here is now baking and stuffing the crust. And we see that in the console. After that, we can prepare a salad. So I'll save again, and we get preparing. And from there, we'll log a pizza to the console. So let's see what the pizza has. You can see its properties. It's a medium. The crust is thin. The sauce is original. And the toppings are still an empty array. We'll get to that. And then it's got the prepare function and some other functions here that we could expand if we wanted to. 
And then we'll go ahead and log a salad as well. And it should look fairly similar. Size is a side salad that we passed in, uh, dressing ranch, and then it's got the prepare, bake, and ready functions. Oh, it's got bake? Let's see why our salad wants to bake. We'll scroll back up and take a look at our salad. And oh, we're creating the salad here. This looks fine, it says toss here. So let's look at the toss method. There's possibly something I didn't do right, yes. It says toss here, and it says tossing here, but over here, the method is called bake. Let's go ahead and change that to toss. And now if we save this, we should see that our salad now will have a prepare, toss, and ready method. Okay, so what about the pizza toppings? Right now we have an empty array for toppings in our pizza objects. So I've got an add topping function here that receives a pizza object and it also receives a topping. And then inside the function, it takes the pizza object toppings and it pushes, because it's an array, so it pushes the new topping to the end of the array. And then it just returns the pizza object. So Let's look at this. It works, but there is an issue. First, we'll create a pizza here, and I'll just call it Jim's Pizza. After that, we can log Jim's Pizza to the console. So it should be at the bottom of our list here. It's medium, thin, original. The toppings are an empty array, and it has the functions we expect, or the methods. And then, let's go ahead and log this add topping Jim's Pizza, and we're going to pass in pepperoni. Now remember, add topping does return the pizza object. So let's take a look. Now we get the same object, but it has an array with one element in it, and that would be pepperoni. And so that's okay. But let's look at Jim's Pizza again, which is the original pizza that we passed in. And if we save this, we can see the array already has an element in it. Now, we might not expect that to happen, and what that is called is mutation, because that is a data structure. An array is a data structure, and by even though we, we passed it into our function, by pushing a topping to that array, we actually mutated the original array, and that could be a problem, especially if you're trying to write pure functions. So for more on this, I'm going to put a link to my Pure Functions video in the description below and also a link to my tutorial on shallow copy versus deep copy. And we're going to look at how to make a shallow copy of our toppings next. Okay, to avoid the mutation problem of the pizza object, we need to use function composition. And we're really going to create a shallow pizza clone function here that is a decorator. And when we see this, we're passing in a function as the parameter, and then this returns an anonymous function that accepts the object and array. And from there, we use the spread operator to create a shallow clone of the object, which is the pizza object, and hold it in this new object. And then we return the function that was passed in and call it on the new object and the array. So once again, this is a decorator, and I do have a tutorial on decorator functions I will link to, but let's look at how we apply this. Underneath, I'm going to create a add toppings instead of add toppings. So this has more than one topping that we will add, and this is an add toppings function. It accepts the pizza object, and it accepts a toppings array. And then inside the function, it takes the pizza toppings property and it adds a new array. And, and that's instead of pushing to the existing array, it makes a new array here, which has the pizza toppings existing array using the spread operator and also any toppings that are in the toppings array that are passed in. And then we return the pizza object. Now I know what you're thinking. If you're thinking functional programming, this still mutates this object, but fortunately, by decorating add toppings with our shallow pizza clone function, we can create a new object before we mutate that new object in add toppings. 
So let's look at this, and here is applying the decorator. So we decorate the add toppings function with the shallow pizza clone. And we do that. Notice we use the let keyword for add toppings. And then we set add toppings equal to the shallow pizza clone function and pass in add toppings as that first parameter, which is the function in our shallow pizza clone. So once we have accomplished that, we're ready to create Tim's Pizza and we create a medium thin original pizza. And after we've created that pizza, we call or we create Tim's Pizza with toppings and then we call add toppings and we pass in Tim's Pizza as the pizza object and then we pass in an array and you can see our array has olives, cheese, and pepperoni in the array. From there, we'll log Tim's Pizza with toppings to the console. So let's save the file. And here we get a toppings array with three toppings in the array. You can see over here in the console. And after that, let's go ahead and log Tim's Pizza, the original pizza object we created. And let's see if Tim's Pizza with toppings is equal to Tim's Pizza. And if we save, you can see Tim's Pizza, the original, still has an array with zero elements or zero toppings for the pizza. And no, they are not equal. That is false. One quick addition to add here, especially if you are into functional programming, we can rewrite the shallow pizza clone. So I've got it right here. Let me copy or, or cut and paste it above. We'll put it right below the one we had before. And I will comment out this version of the shallow pizza clone. And look, we can write it in one line. It receives a function as a parameter. And now here is the next function, the anonymous function, with an object and an array. And if you've watched my currying functions tutorial, you'll know right here that we are currying this function. And it receives a parameter of a function for the first parameter. And then the next time it receives an object and an array, and then it returns a function with the new object using the spread operator and the array. So we've got it all in one line and we can save and we'll still get the same result in the console. In the future, I plan to create a tutorial about refactoring imperative code, which would be like our first version of the shallow pizza clone, into more declarative function expressions like you see here on line 216 for this new version of the shallow pizza clone. That's two different styles or mindsets of programming, imperative versus declarative. When you're learning JavaScript, you usually see imperative. Functional programming is much more likely to use declarative. Well, we've covered a lot today, but I hope you can see why using inheritance isn't as flexible and definitely not as dry as using object composition. And you can do that by making all of your methods into functions and then using the spread operator as you create the functions for those objects. Let me scroll back up for one more quick look at how we did that for just a couple of objects. And here is our create stuffed buttered crust pizza where we actually passed in a pizza object and then added the stuff and butter methods to it. Up above we have the create salad and create pizza right here. And this is just so much more flexible in my opinion than it is to create classes. Now I do like the class syntax and for small projects, a to-do list or something like that, or I do not need the flexibility or I'm not creating so many objects, uh, I have no problem using the class syntax. I do not like to use inheritance though. I much prefer composition, and I hope this tutorial has explained why. I appreciate you all watching and commenting and subscribing. Thank you so much. The channel is growing. I appreciate the comments every week, and I'll talk to you all again very soon.